Fire. I'm not important. They're important. <laughs> Virus is just here to keep me in check. Katie? I drink and I know things. I'm Katie Moe. If you want to know who I am, uh, I don't know. I'll tell you later. <laughs> I'm, I'm a... Is this on? Hello? Hello. I'm in the room. Uh, Chris Weisopel, uh, CTO and founder of Veracode, uh, but I've been doing disclosure stuff since the loft days in the end of the 90s. Oh, was a buddy of RF Policy 1.0. And uh, Renderman, uh, I hack stuff, lately sex toys, uh, but also recently decided to not uh, disclose to certain agencies and countries and such. So. All right, I accidentally seeded my time because they were like serious introductions. <laughs> so here we go being super serious as I always am. Um, Katie Masaurus, founder and CEO of Luta Security. Um, I launched, uh, I helped the Pentagon launch, hack the Pentagon, made it so that uh, our people were no longer thrown in jail for that and instead paid some money. I uh, launched Microsoft's Bug Bunny programs, wrote Microsoft's vulnerability coordination policy, created Microsoft vulnerability research, created Symantec vulnerability research, wrote Symantec's vulnerability disclosure policy, co-author, co-editor of the ISO standards for vulnerability disclosure, vulnerability handling processes, former pen tester, and at stake. Okay. There will be a test later. Yeah, I think we'll go test the Pentagon in front of Congress with cat ears. All right. <laughs> Everything well, except Who was the first, though, Katie or Weld Pond at Congress? Weld, for sure. 1998? Yeah, he was, he was 1998. I was oh. 2018. It only took 20 years for them to invite me. Oh, okay. We're well, making some progress. It's progress. <laughs> okay, so... It wasn't the cat ears. They're vestigial. <laughs> so, um, in deference to your employer, would you like to remember one of the questions that were approved by your employer, or should I just sh shoot they, from they the hip? They technically didn't tell me I was responsible for any of those questions. They just wanted to get a feel for what Yeah, okay, so... <laughs> it's it's only us and Bruce and and a camera. So, um, so I'm Big Easy. A couple of these folks up here, my friends, I hang out with them. You know, we see each other at conferences and things like that. To start off the Ethics Village, I wanted to have a conversation, not necessarily about responsible disclosure. I want to have a conversation about the ethics of responsible disclosure. So when we're talking about this, we're not necessarily talking about responsible disclosure. We're talking about whether or not it is still ethical to responsibly disclose. That is the question that we would like to explore. And if anybody in the panel would like to step down now, get the fuck out. Can you, can you define <laughs> what you mean by responsible disclosure? Is that like tell the vendor and allow them to fix it before you tell the world? Is that your That's simple right. Definition? I, I think that it is no longer ethical to maintain this practice as a security researcher. I'm an ICS SCADA security researcher. I work at the University of Illinois. I've been there for seven years. Before that, I did financial. I've been a part of responsible disclosure and a lot of things, ICS SCADA. And... Um, I'm not speaking for my employer or anybody else, so I'm going to fuck off with virus. But uh, the reason I wanted to have a panel was to just talk about this issue of, you know, Microsoft has a bug bounty program. I don't work there. I am not pointing. <laughs> I am not going to point the finger at anybody who may have used to work at Microsoft. Okay, but I'm saying like, yeah. As an example, Cisco might have a right. vulnerability disclos disclosure program, or big companies have. Oh, it's not <laughs> right. Well, come on. They have these programs. And I can remember back, going back to the 90s, I started one of the first internet service providers in the state of Kentucky. And back then, when people were hung up on the modems, we used to just knock them off with the blue screen of death. And I remember when responsible disclosure first came up, and we were hoping to try and get somebody like Rainforest Puppy to come for this. Maybe next Ethics Village, we can get him out to discuss this. But I really started to think about this, and as I invited panelists, and then I saw Renderman last night, and luckily we were both still sober enough to remember that this panel existed. Ish. Ish. Mm -hmm. I had to shake him a little bit. You really mm -hmm. should be here at 3 o'clock, because I caught your take on, in Twitter a few weeks ago about responsible disclosure. I really think that the question really is, as security researchers, should we still responsibly disclose? 
Okay. Res- Katie looks like she's really anxious to talk, so go ahead. I really am. Responsible. Do you keep using that word? <laughs> I do I not think, think it means what you think it means. Think it means. <laughs> No, seriously, uh, we, we stopped using it in the ISO standard. We stopped using it at Microsoft, and that is thanks to a conversation with Jake Koons, who is formerly Open Security Foundation. Now he runs uh, risk-based security. But Jake Koons came up to me after I was on a responsible disclosure panel at RSA in 2010, and he was like, can we stop using that word? It has moral judgment, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so with that word in mind, I know what you mean. It's that whole, uh, you know, it's that whole thing of letting the vendor... Pa- or letting the vendor take their time to patch before you go public with it. Having had to write Microsoft's policy, we wrote it with three roles in mind. Finder of the vulnerability, coordinator of the vulnerability in multi-party instances like Meltdown Spectre type of things, and vendor, receiving the vulnerability report. It was very important to me as the creator of Microsoft Vulnerability Research that there was no language in there that said we wouldn't release security in details of the security vulnerability before a patch was ready because it was important to, to be able to pull the trigger, pull the ripcord if there was evidence of attacks and whatnot. That is a nuanced difference between Microsoft's policy and Google's policy, which has a strict deadline of disclosure. So there's ways that you can deal with this, and I absolutely made sure that Microsoft never used that word while I was there. Thank you. All right. Okay. <laughs> so thank you, Katie. Okay. <laughs> so you got anything to say, Bruce? Um, I'm glad that Katie was able to to strike that from Microsoft. I I, I mean, the, the responsibility if you're going to use the word lies on the people that wrote the code and the vendor. Um, and that's the way I've always held it. You're responsible for the shit that you write, and if it's bad, it's your problem. I'm sorry, um, Bruce. Can you slow down your words just a little bit? We've got some lag. <laughs> Bruce, yeah, slowly. I'm from up New York. We don't talk real slow there. Oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. Talk like you're from South Carolina <laughs> <laughs> or from the South. I'm from New Orleans, and we have a drawl. You need to draw because we're lagging a little bit. All right. Well, I, I will keep brief. I, I think that the responsibility lies with the vendor um, and not with the decision party. Uh, you're responsible for writing good code. Uh, you're responsible for maintaining your code. And at the end of the day, um, you know, you, you bear that burden. So um, I'm all for striking it from the disclosure debate and, and trying to enforce some accountability on the vendors to do the right thing and push them all forward when it comes to actually running stuff that doesn't suck. Okay, so what about the, the right side over there? Do you have anything to add? Uh, I, I think that the, the big thing right now is like we, – we all consume a lot of these services and such that we're finding vulnerabilities in, and, and we have a stake in this. Uh, previously, I found a bunch of stuff with air traffic control systems, and it's really weird giving a talk about that when you have to fly home afterwards. Huh. You know, so <laughs> my ass is in the game. It, it's you know, I have, I have a stake in this, but I think lately, and and where my position comes from is that you could be helping various. Uh, uh, authorities or regimes, whatever, uh, to facilitate things that you might have other ethical issues with. And it becomes this thing of, yeah, you could be saving life and limb, but you could also be making something more secure that could be then turned or used against people. So it's okay. like, mm, well, it's tricky. So when I, when I look at it, I think there's like, there's a short term benefit to disclosing issues and there's a long term benefit. Um, you know, the short-term benefit is that one little bug gets fixed. Um, and, you know, there's, some, there's certainly some benefit to that. The product gets a little bit better. But the long-term benefit is that um, companies will start to realize it's, if they're going to get all these point whack-a-mole vulnerabilities that they're going to have to deal with, they're going to have to come up with a better process for dealing with them. And then they're going to realize it's even cheaper to f- use the techniques that researchers are using themselves and fix the things. So um, like with uh, Parisa's talk um, at the keynote for Black Hat, she talked about the 90-day, why they had that 90-day um, uh, drop dead date where they'll disclose. And the, the reasoning behind that was it just would force vendors to get better at responding, right? Only and what's that? <laughs> A lot of companies have lawyers too. I mean, yeah, individuals. I, I yes, but um, the uh, 
the compliance, the compliance rate of fixing within 90 days is now at 98%. So over the time that they've done that, they've gotten a set of customers to be able to respond within 90 days. And the fact that Google did that means that you could do the same thing too, and they'd probably be able to respond within 90 days. So I look at there's a long-term game to doing this too, of getting vendors to have an expectation of doing the right thing. Well, this now leads in to the second part of my question. Oh, really? Because I was going to hurt the first one. <laughs> <laughs> well, would you like a chance to hurt the first one before I All right, put so in I the second part? I say this whole thing is irrelevant because this assumes two factors. One, it assumes that the vendor is ethical. Two, it assumes that it is always legal to act subjectively ethically as the finder. And I can sit here and tell you all kinds of scenarios where that is horseshit. Yeah. Um, well, in here, in- I work in M and A. If we don't buy the company, the bugs get burned. I end up sitting on a bunch of O'Day. If we don't do that, everybody goes to jail for insider trading. Uh, yeah. I've also done pen tests where we broke a bug in a vendor and we turn the bugs over, and then that client chooses to sell the bugs, and a non-zero number of those bugs have actually killed human beings. Like these are things I've seen. Yeah. So the concept of debating a generic ethical approach to discovery and or disclosure, like the, doing the right thing is always legal, is fundamentally flawed. So, and then... That is that. absolutely correct. <laughs> Thanks. But the, the, the second part of my question is, what, what I feel and why I am trying to forward the idea that um, it's no longer ethical to use the disclosure process is what vendors are doing with automatic updates. So I have no choice as a user but to accept the automatic update and have no idea what other feature changes the vendor are pushing on me. So you have an important security update. Now all of a sudden you've lost a lot of features in the software that you originally bought and then you got a lot of features you didn't want like, uh, oh, I'm going to start reading your email and targeting advertisement based on the content of your email. Oh, and you just signed off on that in the EULA. And vendors are using the, these, this automatic update to push features out into users. Or rescind features. Hmm? Or rescind features. Or rescind features, exactly. And then I think that's why as researchers, as what does a researcher do when I submit that the process is fundamentally dysfunctional. But that's the process of updates. I mean, yeah, but pop, the, you, the update is the symptom. The update the is one of the way. symptoms. So, so the vendor's like, oh, I can use this mechanism to change the product to suit my needs economically, but not necessarily, oh, this is a security update. You always see these things. You have a security update, and then all of a sudden things change fundamentally in the software that you use to where it, it's not the same anymore. I think the fact is that they're bundling these things that in order to get the security update, you have to accept this other stuff that you may not want. Exactly. And, uh, I don't understand how so, that's the disclosure's problem. Yeah. 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 Because you have no control over that. Some companies are going to do it and some are not. What are you going to do? You're going to research how they're bundling anti-features with fixes before you disclose? I mean, yeah, but you can also that's choose. making it too hard for the disclosure to even well, make a but, decision. But you can also decide that if the the company's a dick about it and does stuff like that, you can say, I don't want to deal with you. I mean, the only way I could see, like, what you're talking about being relevant is in an extremely activist perspective where you're saying, all right, I'm just going to drop Ode time after time on this vendor without telling anybody to force them to release updates that only fix the security flaw and don't package other shit. Which, okay, like, I mean... I, I, I like hostile play. I'm cool with that. But, well, I mean... That's the way we did it in the 90s. This is an ethics talk, like... <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's exactly why this is an ethics talk, because I want to know, what, what do we think? What do we think? Everybody's got cards. What do you think? Is, is what vendors are doing with the process ethical or unethical? So you're, you're advocating splitting up the... Uh, the uh, uh, security updates from all of their updates, right? That's kind of where you're going? Yeah, I think that's what, that's one thing. I don't want to see feature changes in security updates. That sounds great, but I don't think this has fuck all to do with that. Yeah, and so here, so <laughs> well, something that, something that actually freaked me out when I was, when I was working at Microsoft, a CISO of a, of a major 
not utility company, but let's just say a very important company, whatever. Uh, they basically said, look, we'll do automatic updates for our corporate IT for Windows, but there's an XP controller on a smelting device that is, uh, you know, it's basically the investment has to last us for 50 years. So we are never patching that in any way, shape or form. They air gapped it. Good luck with that. <laughs> um, but I mean, essentially like the customer was like, we don't apply updates in certain scenarios. And then another weird thing that I learned was that uh, some customers basically wanted to do update Tuesday, update quarterly instead. They were asking because it cost them to do the testing of the fixes. So it's weird what people will actually accept in the end use scenarios. And that was something that even as a vendor, we were surprised you know, by our customers. We also were surprised that they were not willing to give up XP. We basically kept trying to you know, kick them off and uh, make support you know, that much more expensive. And they just were like, oh, thanks for telling us that it'll, in, it'll instead of $25 million extended support contract, it'll be $50 million next year. Thanks for telling us, we'll just write it into our budget. Like super weird stuff like that. So anyway, this is all beyond the control of the discloser, right? Of the person who found it. Yeah, and can we bring open source into this? Are you going to make open source teams do separate updates too? They have, they, they've been working on an update and they get a security fix in there and you're going to make them do extra work to come out with a separate... I don't have any control. I'm just a moderator of a panel. I'm, no, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying this is, more, this, is, this is more work for the development organization. If they're working towards a new release, to, it's easier to stream in the security fixes. So there's like going to be a higher cost for security fixes if it needs to be separate. The ethical debate's a little different on open source, right? Because if you, if you find a bug in something open source, what's stopping you from also writing the patch? Yeah, what not every example? vulnerability researcher is a good software engineer. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a good patch, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it'll, it'll be a shitty patch. <laughs> it'll be a I'm shitty saying, patch. Like yeah. the guise of anything is better than nothing, if you find the bug, by definition, if it's open source, there's nothing stopping you from fixing the bug. So can I ask a question of the panel, since there's people that have been around doing this a long ass time, and I'm not trying to call anyone old. Um, <laughs> What what was the first real auto update that that was released? By my recollection, I did work for Symantec under contract to evaluate the auto updating of virus definitions. I think in 2000. Um, when did auto updating come into vogue, and has there ever been a separation between functionality and security updates in auto updating? Windows 98 is the earliest one I can remember. Yeah, that's that's pretty close, I think. Well, and so Windows actually, or actually Microsoft had several different updating mechanisms. It's not like each individual team there was at war with each other and just wrote their own shit or anything. Nothing like that ever occurred. But anyway, there was at some point, there was some point, like I think 16 different updaters from different teams. So weird stuff was happening and then they finally yeah, unified. Yeah, exactly, right? And then they finally they finally unified under one system. But even that, you know... Flawed. Anybody? Okay, so I also want this to be interactive because you guys showed up here for some reason. Um, and we have some pretty badass panelists. Does anybody have any questions? About the topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> can, can uh, wait a minute. This is going to be a. Oh, yeah. Just come up here. I don't, think They're just, you need I don't need a microphone at all. Well, for the video. Thanks. So, um, you were talking about the, um, you know, responsible or whatever we want to call it, coordinated disclosure, whatever we want to call it. Coordinated you, disclosure panel. Are we, what's the alternative if we're saying. Coordinated responsible disclosures on ethical. Are we talking full disclosure, or what? What sort of alternatives would you or the panel recommend or suggest? I recommend we acknowledge arms dealing as arms dealing and leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. What is the virus disclosure policy? I am an arms dealer. Fuck off. <laughs> that's that's my disclosure policy. <laughs> pure pure mercenary, huh? I mean. An armed society is a polite society, and I have yet to hear a policy yet that makes the society unarmed. Okay, so now this Canadian needs to speak up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, 
so for me, it, it's a case of, okay, at least you know, if I find something, I can't leave it alone. I have to at least tell somebody, you know, do best efforts. Uh, sometimes that takes an ungodly amount of effort to even find out who the hell to talk to. Like, you know, finding vulnerabilities in air traffic control, there's, you know, it's a global uh, uh, standard, but, you know, ICIO doesn't necessarily have teeth to enforce anything and it's got to be uh, adopted everybody. I, I, I was like, where do you even start with something like that? So I was like, okay, I'm giving a talk at DEF CON where I'm saying, here's my evidence. I can't prove that They've mitigated any of these threats. Uh, please prove me wrong. Um, six years later, DHS actually proved I wasn't crazy, which is a odd position to be in. Uh, but at the same time, I'm looking at it now, and I'm thinking I potentially help them secure things that could be now used against us. Because yes, my ass is on a plane flying home. Those similar kinds of systems, though, are used to drop bombs on people. Let's get a quandary. So it's it's one of those you also have to look at what the system is. If it's some, you know, little IoT gadget or something like that, you know, maybe a little bit of PII or something like that, that's one thing. But as you said, you know, the, the, everything's the, a dual use. Yeah, it, everything's a dual use. So if there's the potential that the technology <laughs> or the owner of the technology use it negatively, I'm like, eh, gonna reconsider. So it's, yeah, drink. <laughs> so, so, um, you know, I think I want to use the word responsible on the vendor side because I just don't think it's it's talked about a, a enough in that context. Um, and, uh, you know, as an example, vendors have been getting more onerous with trying to report a bug. You know, some of them make you go through the bug bounty program if they have one um, with those all these terms and conditions. Um, there was a good a blog post by uh, someone from Project Zero um, about trying to report a bug to Samsung. And the number of different click-throughs they were supposed to go through. In order to report a bug, you had to agree not to ever disclose the bug until they fixed it. Like, that's ridiculous, right? Um, so they decided we can't sign off on that because we have a 90-day, that's our policy is 90-day disclosure. So how can I submit a bug saying I, I won't do that? So um, eventually routed around their whole form-based system and found someone to send an email to. Um, but that's not always easy when it's a foreign company, right? Like finding a right person to speak to um, when it's a Korean company is not that easy. So I, I think vendors are making it increasingly difficult for, for people to disclose to them. They're starting, starting to game the system more. Or it's just they don't realize they need to take, you know, reports. Like I've been doing, like I said, uh, with a bunch of sex toy vendors that have basically failed to realize they were hardware manufacturers making a, a manually operated device. Now they've added connectivity. They're a software company. They don't think of themselves that way. Uh, so trying to wake them up to this this process because like we've all found at one point or another, there's who the hell do you email? Like you there know, are it also goes, sex toy vendors who are selling people's data in volume. Uh, yes. yes. I, mean, I mean, you know, everything's you know information <laughs> so, is valuable, but So the uh, the idea the question was, right, what is what's the alternative if if coordinated vulnerable disclosure? So there isn't any one answer to it. I mean, I think the I think the thing is flexibility in the process and being able to kind of gauge what your principles are as the as the finder, what your principles are ideally as a responsible vendor. Because I agree with Weld here, it's the the responsibility for dealing with these vulnerabilities, short term and long term, is absolutely on the vendor. The vendor has had a huge advantage legally. Um, with lobbyists and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and before the exemptions to the Digital Millennium Copyrights Act, they had a huge advantage over uh, being able to threaten and, and intimidate and silence researchers. And um, one of the main things when I first was asked to to it be involved with the ISO standards, it started actually trying to define the roles of researchers. And I was like, excuse me, I don't know any hackers who strive for ISO compliance, so can we please <laughs> make this about the vendors and what they should be doing and stuff. So that's why the ISO standards are like that. I do think that um, deadlines are actually important. The original, um, you know, all original vulnerable disclosure policies set expectations for deadlines. That is the norm. And what I've seen in, especially in media coverage, um, people freaking out 
about people disclosing the presence of a bug, not even the full technical details, and confusing that, and then, again, blaming the researcher. It's like, kill the messenger a little harder, why don't you? Um, I think part of my like whole life's mission, I mean, this is my 19th year coming to this town for this purpose. Yes, I am old. This is not. This is what happens when your hair goes gray. What, where, um, where do you plug an AC charger in on Bruce? Right, yeah. but... Look, the point, the point oh. here is that, um, is the alternative something else? Is it always better to do full disclosure, you know, without waiting? Is it always better to wait forever? I don't think either of those is the answer. I think reasonable deadlines are important. Setting expectations is important. And then no matter what you do, reasonable people are going to disagree about it. I'm actually super curious what the community response is for what you do in all the multiple gray areas where there is no vendor. I mean, like, so many bugs I've been a part of where the parent organization that owns the company. Oh, Alcohol abuse. Spilled apple juice on you. The parent organization that owns the company that I find the bug in decides, you know what, this bug adds too much risk, we're gonna sell the company. Mm. Okay, well, I'm under NDA because it's a pen test, so I can't tell anybody, but that company doesn't exist anymore for me to pressure to fix it. What happens? Or when I'm on an M&A gig and we don't buy the company, and now we're sitting on a bunch of silent ODA, some of which is in very large companies, like the kind that get targeted by spy agencies. What happens to those bugs? Or bugs where you legit disclose to a vendor, the vendor is uh, forthright and says that they're going to take care of it, and they issue a fake patch and then sells their own bug to an intelligence organization. Also a scenario I've been through. Like, what, what is the response to these gray spaces? I'm curious. There's always a whistleblower. Scare drop. Yeah. Let's okay, know. so so the response to these gray areas is I have to put myself personally at risk simply because I know something. Like no. I owe the world. No, this. I'm saying it's an option. Still up to you to decide what you do, but right. you know, fair enough to to drop details to a reporter, you know, or, or some other uh, interested party. Um, you know, okay, it, yes, it, it, it is not an option. Is an option. I will never take it, but it exists. Right. <laughs> Question in the audience. Huh. This is a question. Mm -hmm. My name is a question. Uh, I was recently contacted by a security researcher who claimed to have found a flaw in our product that uh, led to, as far as they were concerned, full compromise. They would not disclose the details and without a considerable fee that we had to pay for them in Bitcoin. Obviously, uh, this Representing That's not in the ISO standard. No. Yes. Hold on. Well, uh, I believe that is well, well, not, not, not in the ISO standard. Let me re re recap yeah. this, the question for the audience. Right. The, so, he said that there was a security researcher who uh, contacted him with a, a bug. Supposed bug. A supposed bug that was, he was he never disclosed any details of, and they asked for Bitcoin. Lots of Bitcoin. Lots of Bitcoin. Even though it's gone down a little bit today, it still was a lot, probably. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, this, this was a cool building. Yeah. Uh, he, he was trying to blackmail us, and this particular researcher oh, uh, used the word very questionably here. Uh, he's trying to be respectful of the profession, but I don't think he is. Uh, has a history of doing this. He's even gone so far as to use other people's research in order to try to get the magic game. Did he say he was going to drop it publicly if you didn't pay him? Yes, he did. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's just a... Black, but that's, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, can, yeah. Can I, can I just say that's, that's not a researcher, that's right. a criminal. Right. Well, it's not, that's obviously, that is literal extortion. Yeah. Like, that is the definition of extortion. So I don't think that, that I mean... Uh, is it is extortion unethical? I think so, right? Yeah, I think nice we've place got here. that one. Wouldn't it be That's bad if something burned down? But, I mean, but yeah, you but bring you bring up a point that in the increase of bug bounties, a lot of researchers are asking, and some of them are doing straight up extortion like that, and some of them are simply asking if there is a bug bounty present, and they're not accompanying that with a threat. And what I deal with a lot is organizations who confuse those two. They're like, "How dare this researcher ask if we have a bug bounty program?" Like, and I'm like, "Well, they." They did this work and they're just asking, so do you or don't you, you know, type of thing. Did they did they threaten to do anything with the information? No? Well, then they're not threatening you. That's not extortion. Well, I, I, I've seen ahead, even where language and culture issue get in the way. Uh, there was an interesting graphic I saw the other day of where the bug bounties were coming from and then who was fulfilling them. Um, and there's a lot of overseas 
uh, bug hunters. And I have had numerous exchanges where it was clear we were having a language breakdown and a person could read it as extortion or you could read it as, do you have a bug bounty uh, uh, that I can access? Um, and uh, so it's a pretty nuanced line there, I think. Yeah, I had to testify before Congress about this a little bit, you know, um, so just a little. Uh, so the Uber data breach, yeah, just a little testimony. <laughs> a little bit cattier. So the so the uh, the whole Uber data breach, 50 million records downloaded by a Florida man. Why is it always a Florida man? Um, <laughs> exactly. But, the, but the, what happened was, uh, you know, Uber, this guy emailed them. He didn't actually know about the bug bounty program. They referred him to the bug bounty program saying, oh, we have one over here, friendly researcher who's telling us about a flaw. And, uh, you know, the maximum payment was $10,000 for the bug bounty. Literally, the emails that were released, he's like, yeah, I was thinking more six figures. So he successfully extorted them for 10 times the amount of their regular bug bounty. And Uber, during that hearing, actually said, yes, that was an extortion payment. And we should not have laundered it through our bug bounty program. So absolutely, like there, there are ethical lines that were breached in that. And I think Uber took responsibility for it. I think that was the right thing for them to do. I, I have a question. Now I'm going to change the subject just a little bit and maybe turn this around. I had a career at a power utility before I was at the University of Illinois. And I had the, you know, a really cool job where I hung out with hackers and I hacked the shit out of my SCADA system. So I got to disclose a lot of O'Day, some of it which is still out there a decade later. Now, the question, because I heard the word criminal earlier, when a vendor comes in and threatens the career of everybody that is working at a place, so it says, oh, if you want to be a consultant when you retire, you should really forget about this and just let this go. Um, should that be criminal? And is that, is that illegal? I don't know. Coercion from people in authority to suppress bugs. If we're going to talk about criminalization in policy versus private, how about we talk about why the hell is it a standard practice that those at the Oval Office decide they get to move into private sector afterward? <laughs> we're going to talk about criminal. Mm. We can talk about it at that level. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, personally, as a discloser of many vulnerabilities that I know are still out there, you know, from an ethical perspective, how long do you wait when civilization teeters in the balance? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I made this panel to ask this question. So what can you live with? So, so I think Fif part of 15 it. 15 years. Well, I'll have a much better talk for ShmooCon, Bruce. So I, I disclosed the bug to Microsoft. This was around like 2003 or something. And they took a whole year to fix it uh, because it was in their um, file auditing system, um, which helps them get C2 compliance. So the existence of the bug made everyone who had to use a C2 compliant um, Windows non-compliant, which is why C2 compliance is ridiculous. But... Um, it was a bug where if you used hard linking in NTFS, you bypass the auditing system. It seemed to me like an easy thing to fix. They said we had to completely rewrite the auditing system to have like new flags on every single file. It wasn't something that we could just easily update. We'll do it with NT Service Pack 3 or 4, I don't know, uh, or Windows 2000 Service Pack 3 or 4. And they gave a good explanation to me. Uh, they gave me a good technical explanation. They gave me status along the way every couple months that they were actually working on the problem. And they, they said there was just no way to fix it faster. And the, the fact that they gave me confidence that they were actually acting in good faith. Some bugs just do take that long. And so I waited, yeah. right? But if, you, if they were completely silent with me, they didn't acknowledge I sent, gave them the bug, or they were completely silent with me, I would have no idea that they're ever going to fix it. So why not disclose? So I, I think that's part of it is, is that vendor finder communication can give you confidence to wait. That is in the ISO standard. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's all about good faith. Like, you know, did you try your best to disclose the vulnerability? You know, did you pat on enough doors, ring enough phones? Uh, sometimes, yeah, you hit a wall. 
that it's really difficult and you need to just say like there's a problem here that needs to get fixed if the only way i need to you know that i can do this is to you know send up a flare and then set something on fire here uh it may need to be may may be necessary but again it's if you've got a, a case where yeah they seem to be a little slow but because they're having to you know, gut half the system and start fresh you know you have to take that into consideration i think it'd be unethical on the side of the researcher to say nope nope only 90 days you got to triple shift you know like no it doesn't work that way or you just accept it's not good. <laughs> Why, why would the researcher have to, in your words, try their best to resolve these things? It's not the onus should but, not be on the researcher. No, but before they, you know, drop Ode public to at least have given it a fair shot to have uh, tried to report it and you know, do if the, a fair shot even it, exists. Yeah. yeah. That's, oh, yeah. That's right. right. Like, so, but that's, so many, so many organizations actually don't have any clear way to report them. You were yeah. giving the, you know, example even with ones that have bug bounty programs, they don't have a clear way to report. So yeah, I mean, it shouldn't be on the researcher to try and find a contact via Twitter. It's just not functional. It's so, not. I mean, I'll, I'll put myself on the spot. I'm sitting on a bug right now in the largest healthcare management software in the world. Like have actual confirmation that ninety three point one percent of the entire agency, use, or the entire industry uses it, and I, it was a pen test for a company that owned a company that owned a company, and about halfway up the chain, like day two into my job, they said, you know what, this is actually a massive, massive risk. Uh, we're just going to sell the company so we don't have to deal with this bug. So they did, and they never told the vendor. I can't legally tell anybody. I'm just sitting on this bug. I mean, this is like money. This is like millions, plural, of dollars, right? There is no, eth like, what is my ethical response? <laughs> what, is the, what is the threat to life and limb? Do, do you have anything, Bruce, on this? I was, I was just going to ask if, um, is it okay to drop O'Day? I mean, to render man's statement before, like, why is it on the researcher? Like, is it okay just to drop O'Day? I think there's some nuanced answers, but in general, can I just blanket drop it and feel okay about myself? Yes, and uh, it was ruled that code is speech, so it, at least in the United States, um, they can't go after you for that. Um, you know, it's, I think, where some, where some problems may arise are things where the laws, especially in the United States, uh, will allow companies uh, to go after the researchers for doing so regardless, right? Um, and they, even the legal threat and the threats to the employer, that was the, what you brought up as well. Um, but I mean, who in this room has dropped O'Day? Put your hand up. Yeah, my hand. Me and up. Katie did it yeah, together. Yeah, we freaking did it, right? That didn't come out right. We, <laughs> we dropped O'Day. We dropped O'Day, and it's like that was. See, the thing was. Oh, that move. We so. <laughs> it was so good. No, um, what happened was we. Well, this Good. was this was a carryover from at stake days. We had an advisory. We were trying to contact the vendor for I think four months, no response. We called them on the phone. I hate phones, and like we you know we had email threads for four months. So transition, we get bought by Symantec and everything like that. Eventually, we're like we're gonna publish a non detailed version of this just to warn users of the threat because especially as a you know, security defense company, we had the right to protect our customers about a vulnerability we knew about, right? So we dropped O'Day and oh my God, the anger mails. And I think, I wish I had saved that voicemail because there were swears I did not know and that is unique for me. Um, <laughs> well, they have well I, I think part of it was this is the first time this company had to deal with this type of issue, which is, there's always a first time for every company. They called us irresponsible. You know, that was true. There's always that a first time. Yeah. Yes. So um, I, I think that's that's if you're the if you're the the, the finder for and dealing with a company for the first time, it's going to be a lot more work because they're not going to have any way to even communicate with you, really. And think about that. At the time, Symantec was the largest security software vendor in the world. We were threatened by the vendor for dropping a no detailed advisory to let people know that something they had in their possession was insecure and that the vendor hadn't responded. Well, so were, think about how hard it is for an individual researcher to deal with this. It is so not the onus is not on the this, researcher. This brings up a question that came from the back. Medical devices. So you have an O-Day on a medical device like a pacemaker or an insulin pump or something like that, and you tried to responsibly disclose this vulnerability to the maker and the manufacturer. So 
Where does the line get drawn if nothing is done about this? I think you can send that to the FDA and they're going to take care of it. Not true from experience. Yeah. Really? Yes. <laughs> what did so, you say? There, there, <laughs> Not true? That somebody who actually has relevant current experience in that exact area needs to talk. So uh, my name is Steve Christy Coley. Uh, I work for the MITRE Corporation. We provide subject matter expertise to the FDA in exactly this area. The, the mic yeah, doesn't yeah. reach back there. It's tied up. Yeah, it's really worth it. I can do what I want for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> Come on up here so they can hear you. Uh, so my name is uh, Steve Christy Coley. I work at MITRE. Uh, supporting FDA, providing uh, subject matter expertise in the area of medical devices when they receive vulnerabilities. And so uh, FDA has regulatory authority over medical devices when it comes to safety, and of course cybersecurity can have an impact on safety. Um, I've seen them wield uh, their influence uh, which is much easier than in apparently the unregulated world of uh, software. So uh, anybody who's had any difficulties, certainly come to me or uh, you can uh, reach out to the FDA as well. They are literally here. You can go to the biohacking village and meet them. But uh, uh, yes, there has been some uh, right. critique. But uh, Again? Uh, <laughs> there, there has been some critique of their practices in the past, but they've been doing uh, as much as possible to uh, uh, to make it better. No, and I think I think that's an important point is that everybody was was really, really terrible or so terrible. They didn't even exist on the scale of terrible to not terrible. Um, and I think that we should be encouraging, especially the regulatory authorities who regulate vendors when they're making progress. Agreed. Not a good process before, not good outcomes, but we should be encouraging those regulatory authorities to come down on the vendors who they regulate. When they want to. Yeah, yes, but sir. we just encourage them to keep going. Push, push, push. Yeah, I mean, it's a case of if, if you are making something that has the ability to affect life and limb, that's going to have to have some responsibility attached to it. Okay. So I did, I talked to some Congress people last night and they asked, how can we more, uh, you know, have greater engagement with the researchers? How can we, you know, help them and everything? And I said, go after the vendors, Congress critters. This is what you should be doing. Write some more laws that actually apply to the vendors and regulate the vendors and reform the C uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Well, and it incentivized the vendors too. It can't all be sticks. There's got to be carrots there. Yeah, I mean, can we just get... A no fault disclosure mechanism. Hmm. I mean, because one of those no, no like, fault disclosure mechanism. That's a great I mean, idea. Like, I mean, like I'm a sitting example of like, yeah, sure, all the things you guys said. Also, none of those will help me right now. Right. right. <laughs> like, just I'm just putting myself. In I the think spotlight. maybe okay. a, <laughs> a vulnerability researcher should be treated like a common carrier, like in telephone systems. You know, agnostic. This is not anything other than what has been discovered. And they shouldn't be faulted for anything that they've discovered because they're not the, the necessary the root cause of that. It was some mistake made at the vendor. And you were asking me about a question. I was pulling on my pants, so I probably should get no, a question. I really was just trying to take them off. Um, <laughs> just, just one. No, I think it's, it's, it's some, some people on the panel will know this is probably a question I would have been uncomfortable asking maybe six or seven months ago, so I apologize. It might be controversial. But I, I think from a regulatory perspective, when something affects life and limb, I'm curious what role the government should play, not only just for vendors, but also for researchers. Um, because when you're, when you're not all speech is protected, right? So if you're, if you're disclosing something that you found that could cost someone their lives or cause them serious personal damage, not companies, but individuals, like what, what role does the government play in that? Well, one, I think you're assuming that a researcher is going to necessarily know all the uses of, of the code that they found the vulnerability in, right? They are not necessarily going to know that something they found a vuln in, you know, over here is actually also code reuse used in some kind of life and limb scenario. So I think there's, there's a degree of having to just put it this way. Researcher already did a bunch of free labor, right? Having them understand ex all the use cases of the code, I don't think that's in scope. And, and, Frankly, um, I think what we need to think about is like, what is the real threat to life and limb? 
is it full disclosure or is it non-disclosure of discoverable bugs? It's, and I think that's the biggest danger. It's, it's really nuanced, right? I think yeah, like we're I, making I, this black and white, but I think the question that I really like am interested in is does the role – of the government, government include any regulation around researchers and how they. I, would, how they I, would say I, I think terrible for that, right? Because if you yeah. look at public safety, it's illegal to walk into a room and yell fire if there's no fire because you're inside yeah. a panic. If there is a fire, you're not lying, so you're fine. There's no rule that says you have to yell fire if you see fire, right? Right. So, so just because we may subjectively decide that ethics exist on both sides, it doesn't mean that it's the job of policy to police both sides. Yeah. Uh, where I think uh, government needs to step in uh, more so is uh, so over at B sides there was a, a talk at the uh, the underground track uh, about the federal uh, FBI uh, cyber ninja program, basically providing access to uh, FBI people and their their technical uh, uh, technical operations that before you pull the trigger on on something and and go all the way, let them know they're actually working with the EFF. You know, Kurt uh, for the EFF was there, you know, with Russ from the FBI, where the analogy they drew was you find a big bag of drugs on the street and you're like, I should probably drop these off at the police station. Said no one black ever. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> 